I'd like to welcome everybody to today's webinar. I am Alan Jay, Director of Outreach and Development here at the Zionist Organization of America. On behalf of ZOA and our partner organizations, the Yesha Council, My Israel, and the Shiloh Policy Forum, I would like to welcome you first to this first installment of our three-part mega event in support of Judea and Samaria to be aired on three consecutive Sundays. Please keep your microphones on mute for the duration of the program. There will be a question and answer session later in the program, which will be facilitated through the Zoom chat feature found in the middle bottom of your screen. We will get to as many questions as possible. And once again, please keep your microphones on mute. With no further ado, I'm going to hand the program over to Sarah Haetzni Cohen, Chairman of My Israel, and our moderator for today. Sarah. Hello, thank you, Alan. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Judea and Samaria virtual MIGA event. We are very excited to be here today with you and look forward to seeing you in the next two Sundays as well. This event is a result of a collaboration between four different Zionist organizations, the ZOA, the Zionist Organization of America, the Judea and Samaria Yesha Council, the Shiloh Policy Forum, and My Israel Movement, Israel Shali. It is broadcast live also on Arut Sheva's website, reaching tens of thousands of households. My name is Sarah Etznikoen, and I'm now talking to you live from Jerusalem. I'm the chairwoman of My Israel Movement. My Israel Movement is a Zionist action group that uses social media to mobilize hundreds of thousands of activists and encourage Zionist activism and pro-Israel activities on the internet and in the field. Together with our partner organizations, we decided to organize this event after understanding that even amongst supporters of Judea and Samaria, there was a true need to expand and deepen the knowledge with respect of this region. Indeed, in the complex period we're all in, in the middle of an international pandemic, we want to take a few days and put all of these pressing issues on the side and take a deeper and longer lasting look at the region. For decades, the hostile media and international organizations painted a distorted picture which does not reflect what is really happening on the ground. Our goal in this, in this few days, in this very exciting event, is to bring the real Judea and Samaria into your salon. We want you to understand the reality. We want you to understand the truth on the ground. We have only one request. Take all the information you will gather today and in the next meetings and spread it. Do not keep it only to yourself. Beca become ambassadors for Judea and Samaria and for Israel. We have thousands of viewers right now in our various platforms, including Zoom, Facebook, YouTube, and Arut Sheva. We urge each and every one of you take the information you will get and use it to defend Judea and Samaria. We need you. Of course, you can always get more information on the websites of the different organizations. Go to this website, get even more knowledge, and use your knowledge to fight the lies that told against us. This is the only way we will defeat the ignorance that threatens us. The Middle East is a tough neighborhood, and Israel is the only democracy in the region. In recent years, there has been significant progress in the geopolitical field, and we can see serious achievements that push Israel, the region, and the entire world forward. All this would not have happened without, without our great friend, the United States, and without you, our friends, our family from all around the world. But these achievements are not enough. We want to keep moving forward. Of course, we cannot ignore regional and local trends. We need to take into account the ongoing challenges coming from reality on the ground in Judea and Samaria, and of course, in border Israel. In the next three Sundays, we will hear from top of the line experts and, and practitioners 
uh, and gain deeper understanding of the area. We will do this from a perspective that recognizes our historical roots, our legal rights, and the fact that this land is the land of the Jewish people. Today, on the first of the three Sundays, we will deal with e the economic situation on the ground and various aspects of what is called economic peace. We will focus on building bridges through cooperation rather than being rather than walls of separation. Next Sunday, February 14th, you will invite you, uh, we will invite you to start your Valentine's Day with a special program on the legal basis of for our rights. 18 months ago, then Secretary of State Pompeo recognized our rights to the region. And on this day, we hope to discuss the, the ramifications both of those rights and the, of the US recognition of those rights. Finally, in the last session on February 21st, we will discuss the effects of the historical Abraham Accords on the region as they resulted in a paradigm shift that showed that peace can, sorry, that, kiss, that peace can be achieved without hurting Israel's right to its eternal homeland and her security. We are very excited and invite you to be a part of our all events. I would like to open today's with meeting with a special greeting to all of you attending the Judea and Samaria, uh, Judea and Samaria Amiga event by President of the State of Israel, Mr. Reuven Rivlin. יקיריי, ההתיישבות ביהודה ושומרון התבססה בימיה הראשונים על תמיכה הדוקה של תנועת העבודה, ולימים היא קיבלה חיזוק ועוצמה במאמציו של מנחם בגין להקים עוד ועוד אלוני מורה. כיום, ממרחק הזמן, ועם השינויים המשמעותיים ביחסי הכוחות במזרח התיכון, כן, והסכמי השלום, שנרקמים באזורנו, יש קונצנזוס רחב בציבור הישראלי על רוב רובם של היישובים, והמציאות מלמדת שההסכמה הזאת הולכת וגדלה. וכמי שקשובים לחשי הזמן ולשינויים בזירה הבינלאומית, עלינו לפעול בכל הכוח על מנת לקדם את הפריחה הכלכלית באזור כולו. שיתופי פעולה כלכליים יאפשרו לנו יותר ויותר מקומות עבודה לכל תושבי האזור, יהודים וערבים. היום, השקעה ביהודה ושומרון היא הזדמנות אדירה למי שרואה ממרחק. המציאות הפוליטית תביא, כך אני מקווה, לפיתוחה של כלכלה באזורי תעשייה משותפים, כלכלה שתהיה לטובת התושבים כולם. פיתוח התעשייה יכול להיות הן בסיוע התעשייה המסורתית והן בקידום יוזמות הייטק, פיתוח סביבתי ועוד. רק מתוך חיים יחד ובגובה העיניים ייבנה אמון בין אנשים. שלום נבנה בין אנשים, לא, לא בתרכיני הדיפלומטים, אלא במפעל, בעבודה, בעבודה המשותפת, שכן מכאן רק השמיים הם הגבול. לאורך השנים הבעתי את עמדתי הברורה כי מדינת ישראל חייבת להיות מדינה יהודית ודמוקרטית. בכל שטח שבו נחיל את ריבונותנו, עלינו לתת זכויות וגם חובות לכלל הדרים בארץ. שכן לא נגזר עלינו לחיות יחד. נועדנו לחיות יחד גם אם יש בינינו כאלה שלא כל כך אוהבים אחד את השני. יש למתיישבים חלום גדול, 
וכדי שהחלום יתגשם, על ראשי ההתיישבות לפעול להעמקת החיים יחד, לבנות קשרים של אמון לדורות הבאים, שהרי בני איש אחד אנחנו, כולנו בניו של אברהם. אברהם אבינו, האב של שנינו. זה הזמן, זו השעה, ואם לא עכשיו, אי מתי. אז יהיו ברוכים וחזקים. Thank you, President Rivlin. The Honorable Ambassador Gilad Erdan recently took on the challenging and important role of being dual ambassador of Israel, both to the United States and to the United Nations. Ambassador Erdan also sent us a greeting for this special occasion. Shalom, everyone. We have a moral, legal, and historic right to the land of Israel, including, of course, Judea and Samaria. One of the main reasons I took on the dual role of Israel's ambassador to the United States and the United Nations is so I can proudly share that truth with the world. From the days of the Tanakh, Judea and Samaria have been the heart of the Jewish people's connection to their homeland. Today, the situation is no different. Friends, the economic cooperation between Jews and Arabs in Judea and Samaria is a model of true coexistence that benefits all involved. This became very clear to me as I battled the anti-Semitic lies of BDS as Minister of Strategic Affairs. Businesses in Gush Etzion, Balkan, and many other places provide dignified jobs, better wages, and space for Jews and Arabs to build relationships that increase the chances of reconciliation and peace. The new peace agreements prove that to build a life together, you need a bottom-up approach. People-to-people -people connections are essential. This is what is happening today all across Judea and Samaria. As ambassador, I will continue to support our communities in Judea and Samaria, and I will work to strengthen their economic activity, not only because it is our right, but because I believe that it increases the chances for peace. Friends, we have to continue sharing the truth about Israel. That is why events like this are so important. I wish you a successful event and thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you so much, Ambassador Erdogan. Mr. Morton Klein is the president of the ZEO, the Zionist Organization of America. It is difficult to describe in words the contribution of the organization, the ZEO. And of course, of Mort himself to the prosperity and security of the State of Israel. Over the years, the State of Israel has always known that it has a warm and loving organization overseas. The, the, sorry, the, the thousands of members of the ZOA get up in the morning thinking of Israel and go to sleep thinking of Israel. We feel your support and we are stronger thanks to it. I would like to invite you to hear a few words from Mr. Martin Klein, the president of the ZOA, Zionist Organization of America. Hi, my name is Martin Klein. I'm the national president of the oldest personal group in the United States, the Zionist Organization of America, the ZOA. I'm pleased and honored to be with all of you today with President Rivlin, with Ambassador Gilad Yerdan, all of today's speakers and so many friends at this Judea and Samaria mega event. The ZOA stands with our Jewish brothers and sisters in Judea and Samaria. These lands are guaranteed to the Jewish people by God, by binding international law, by history, and by the blood of the courageous Jewish boys who recaptured and liberated the Jewish people's lands in 1967. 
a little over a century ago. The ZOA was at the 1919 Paris Peace Conference, helping to present the proposals that led to the international recognition of the Jewish people's rights to this very land. Throughout the years, ZOA has been educating American public, the Congress, that Judea and Samaria are not occupied Palestinian territories. They are the Jewish people's lawful historic lands. At ZOA student and adult Israel trips, we bring them to Efrat and Ariel and Hebron and Beit El. You and the Israeli government must insist that birthright and the federations and Israel bonds and APAC and synagogue trips must visit these extraordinary and ancient Jewish towns. ZOA has also been fighting for Judea and Samaria at the World Zionist Congress. We successfully passed resolutions to stop BDS targeting Judea and Samaria. With Yesha's help, the ZOA coalition and our friends in the rational centrist and religious camp won a stunning victory there. We are now positioned to promote investments by Israel's national institutions in Judea and Samaria, among other key issues. Last year, the ZOA placed huge banners in Jerusalem, promoting ZOA's Sovereignty Now campaign. ZOA also publicized our compendium of 13 reasons that ZOA strongly supports Israel restoring her rightful sovereignty over Jewish Judea Samaria and the Jordan Valley. You can see a summary of our 13 reasons at the top of the ZOA.org website. I'll briefly mention a few of these reasons. First, multiple international legal agreements and treaties designate Judea and Samaria as part of the Jewish homeland to be settled by the Jewish people. ZOA often reminds American officials that the United States president signed and the US Senate ratified one of these treaties, the Anglo-American Convention of 1924, confirming the Jewish people's rights to this land. Second, the UN Charter guaranteed the Jewish people's rights to these lands even after the expiration of the mandate. Third, restoring sovereignty also assures Israeli security and its defensible borders and gives Israel the ability to protect herself by herself. Without Judea and Samaria's breadth and elevated terrain, Israel's borders would be narrow than nine miles wide, impossible to defend. If a Palestinian Arab state is created there, Iranian proxy terror groups would surely launch constant rocket attacks on all of Israel, including Israel's major population centers and its airport. Fourth, restoring sovereignty provides stability, normalcy, humanitarian rights, legal protections such as labor laws, and freedom from excessive military bureaucracy to over half a million Jewish residents there and prevents the unconscionable ethnic cleansing of Jews. Fifth, restoring sovereignty keeps the Jewish historic and biblical heartland within the Jewish nation and assures access to Jewish holy sites and vital archaeological sites. Here is where Abraham purchased his and Sarah's burial place. King David was anointed and ruled there. Jacob slept and dreamt there. Joseph is buried there. The ancient tabernacle stood for hundreds of years there. The Maccabees established their base there. The Jewish kingdoms existed there for hundreds of years. The Jews are the people indigenous to this land. We are called Jews because we are from Judea. The Arabs are not indigenous. Most hail from Arabia and North Africa. There was never a Palestinian Arab state here, never a Palestinian king or queen. Israel has already waited 54 years since Israel liberated Judea and Samaria. During that time, the Palestinian Authority rejected multiple extraordinarily generous offers, launched deadly intifadas, BDS and lawfare, demanded preconditions, and refused to negotiate even when their preconditions were met by Israel continues to name schools, streets, and sports teams after Arab Jew killers and continues to pay terrorists to murder innocent Jewish people. It's clear more land is not what the Palestinians want. It's Israel's destruction. Israel must insist that these belligerent anti-peace Palestinian actions end or peace will remain impossible. Restoring Israel's lawful internationally guaranteed sovereign rights is not a unilateral act. It is long overdue justice. On the other hand, when Israel fails to restore her sovereignty, when Israel fails to act on the fact that this is the Jewish people's land, that failure, that failure gives strength to the enemies who falsely claim that Israel's land belongs to the Arabs. Tens of thousands of Jews and more are making Aliyah now in the wake of enormous increase in worldwide anti-Semitism. As former Prime Minister Yitzhak Shamir once said to me, let's help these Jews establish their homes in the Jewish homeland of Judea and Samaria. I agree. We love you. We support you. God bless America. God bless Eretz Yisrael. Thank you, Mr. Morton Klein. I, I listened to this a few times, and every time it makes my heart goes 
you know, it's so exciting. And really, thank you. Thank you for everything you're doing to, to the land, to, to Israel, to the state of Israel, and to, to every one of us. Um, let's continue. Igal Dilmani is the CEO of Judea and Samaria Yasha Council. The Yasha Council is a body that unites all the authorities in Judea and Samaria. It is a body with a record of action and advocacy on behalf of Judea and Samaria and for Israel as a whole. Igal will give us today a short lecture explaining the situation in Judea and Samaria with emphasis on the economic processes happening now in you know, these days in this historical land. I'm happy to call on Eagle to share with us a, a perspective that I'm sure you have not heard in the mainstream media. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you all that you are here to hear about Judea and Shomron, Judea and Samaria. And I want also say thank you to our partners, partners in the ZOA, in My Israel, in the Shiloh Policy Forum, all the people that help us to arrange this big virtual event of Judea and Samaria. Let's begin. In Judea and Samaria, we have 24 activity local authority, municipality, city, and regional council. The Yesha Council, is the umbrella organization for, the, for this authority. We take care of their shared interests. We take care of this land, which is so important to the Jewish history, to the Jewish nation. Today, 476,000 Israeli live in this area in Judea and Samaria and the Jordan Valley. 53 years ago, no Israeli lived here at all. And today there are almost half million. It's a miracle. We're moving quickly towards the goals of having 1 million Israeli citizens here in the historical homeland of the Jewish nation. I want to speak about our three goals of Yesha Council. One is to apply the Israeli sovereignty over this area. Two is to bring 1 million Israeli to live here in Judea and Samaria and the Jordan Valley, what we call Chazona Million, the vision of one million. And three, to develop the area with road, transportation, water, electricity, and, eco and economic infrastructure. Today, I want to speak about the third goal. We believe that it's time to think differently, that it's time to think strategically about the future of this area. Today, we are busy together with other government ministries making master plan, plan for electricity, transportation, water, alternative energy, industry, tourism, economic, and environment. The connection of Judea and Samaria to the rest of the state of Israel is of great importance as part of the desire or to bring normalization to the region. When I worry about the construction of a new road so that there won't be accident, it is not a road that will be just for me or other Jewish, but, it, but rather it will be for Arabs and all the people that live at this area as well. When we add improvements in infrastructure of water and electricity, in the same, it's the same infrastructure that will be supplied to the Arab village that are located in the area next to the Israeli community. My worry and concern for the future of the area are for the entire region. There is a claim that the Israeli community are burdened on Israel and make difficult for the Arab life. The people who say this are people who don't let the facts confuse them. We believe that we are here not the problem, we are the solution. Let's hear some facts about it. The Gaza Strip is under control of the Palestinian government and there is no Israeli presence there. It's ruled by the Hamas radical Islamic regime 
Israel take out, took out all of the Jewish community from there. Can you remember Gush Katif until today? In Judea and Samaria, we have Israeli security control and Israeli has established communities here in Judea and Samaria in the Asha Council. If we compare the quality of life between the Arabs who live in Gaza under the Hamas control and between the Arabs of Judea and Samaria who live next to the Jewish community, we will find interesting things. Here's some facts. The unemployment rate in Gaza at 2018 was 52%. In Judea and Samaria, it was only 17%. The more time passed since our presence in the region, the more the situation worse in Gaza. The labor force of non-working people and job seekers in the, is 25% in Gaza and eight and only 8% in Judea and Samaria. The GDP per capita in Gaza is, six, is about $1,600 per capita. If I compare it to $4,200 in Judea and Samaria, the total value of export in Gaza is $8.2 million. In Judea and Samaria, it's $1 billion. Most of this go to Israel. Jewish presence in the area also create jobs for the Palestinian people. The number of Palestinian residents working and earning a living in the entire state of Israel is about 140,000 workers. 20,000 of them work in the 20 industrial and agriculture area in the Israeli territory in Judea and Samaria. The average salary of those employment in Israeli company is more than double the average salary in the Palestinian Authority. Those every workers who work outside of the Palestinian Authority does not only support his nuclear family, but other family member in his big, big family, what we know as the Hamula. In other words, several families make a living from single salary. In fact, a quarter of the Palestinian population income comes from working together with Israel. The current situation where because of international pressure, this region is not developed, is the greatest burden on Arab in these regions. Instead of helping the Arab, People prefer hurting them if it's also out Israel presents here. This is what the BDS movement tried to do when they say don't buy products from the agriculture and the factories in Judea and Samaria. While those factories support the entire population and bring salary for Jewish and Arab together. I want to end with a point of view that might make a lot of people upset. But in other angle, angle, this is a good news for the future. The reality is that the economic of Israel and the people, the Arab people that live at this area are connected and it is very difficult to separate at us and to separate our economy. We need their workforce. They depend on us for salaries and developments of our infrastructure. The good news is this share economic is precisely the main way today to peace and quiet in the region. It's in Judea and Samaria, here in Israel, here in the Middle East, and from Israel to the Gulf states, like we saw at the Abraham Accords. This is what we call the economic peace. And this is what we do here at Judea and Samaria. Thank you all for your listening and enjoy the rest of the event. Thank you. Thank you, Egal. All this information will be available on YouTube later on. You can always reach it. 
Um, so we're now moving to our next, uh, our next chapter in this very exciting event. We will begin the second part of the event. It is a, a fascinating panel featuring experts and practitioners on the issue of economic peace and building bridges between population using the economy. We would love for you to be an active part of this conversation as well. I invite you to ask questions and comments in the chat on the Zoom or in the comments on Facebook and YouTube. Since time is limited, we will not be able to get all the questions, but we promise to try and present selected questions to our panelists. We have three distinguished participants in today's panel. Dr. Yechiel Leiter, holds undergraduate degrees in law and political science, a graduate degree in international relations and a PhD from Haifa University in political philosophy. He also served in senior government positions in the ministries of education, finance and transportation and the policy advisor to the president of Paraguay. He is currently a senior fellow at the Shiloh, Shiloh Policy Forum and head of Forum's International Department. One word about the Shiloh Policy Forum, because he is one of the partners who, is, who initiated this event. The Shiloh Policy Forum is a research and policy institute established by the Kohelet Policy Forum, which aims to strengthen, develop, and expand Jewish communities in all parts of Israel. Thank you, Echiel, for being here today with us. Mr. Avi Zimmerman. Avi Zimmerman is the president of the Judea and Samaria Chamber of Commerce and Industry. He is also the CEO of the Integrated Business Roundtable, an impact investment group that supports the development of the Israeli-Palestinian uh, Palestinian business ecosystem. Thank you, Avi, for being here uh, today with us. Thank you, Sam. And hi, uh, Mr. Yaakov Berg. Yaakov Berg is the founder and the CEO mm -hmm. of Sagot Winery. I recommend on this one. Sagot Winery is located in the Binyamin region and is one of many wineries in Judea and Samaria that produce close to 2 million bottles of wine annually. Thank you all for being here today. Um, so I will open the panel with an identical question for all participants. Um, I would like uh, I would like to sh you to share with us, and we'll start with you, Yechiel. How do you define normalization, and what is this? You know, we use this phrase of economic peace, and I want you to I want you to give your perspective of what is this economic peace we're all talking about? How does it affect the region? And what's the, what's the opportunities that it opens to us? So Yechia, let's begin with you and then continue. Thank you, Sarah. It's a pleasure to be here. Shalom to Avi and shalom to Yaakov. It's, it's always a disadvantage to meet with Yaakov uh, virtually because when you meet in person, you get to drink a l'chaim. Uh, and, and here we, we can only have a chaim by ourselves. Sarah, uh, you know, you're a, you're a people person. You're doing a great job virtually. I know it's difficult to be a hostess online. But, uh, uh, my kids here are, are doing a, a much better job uh, than me, <laughs> being quiet. Well, 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 call a to them. Um, let, let me, before I um, uh, begin, let me just um, extend a, a big virtual hug to Mort Klein. Uh, we go back about... Um, I think 32, 31 or 32 years, I was speaking in a synagogue in Philadelphia representing uh, Yesha at that time. I don't know, we were a few 10,000 uh, residents today, Baruch Hashem, we're close to half a million. And uh, you know, a fellow got up from the audience and came up to the front and gave me a big hug. He said, I'm more Klein. And that was long before he, he became president of the ZOA. And since then he's done a remarkable yeah. job relentlessly pursuing truth and justice for Israel. And now he's having a little bit of a hard time with what are called progressives, although they're not progressives at all, they're reactionaries. 
So more just uh, keep your head down. Uh, we know what it means to get ha to have stones and Molotov cocktails thrown at you. We've done that for a long time. So uh, we've been the recipients, I should say. So just keep going and you'll keep growing and doing a great job. And of course, to uh, my colleagues, Yigal Demoni, the CEO of, uh, of the Esha Council and my most esteemed colleague who really established and runs the Shiloh Policy Forum on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, Dr. Anat Roth. Um, re regarding uh, your question, um, Sarah, you know, normalization means doing it and not talking about it. Uh, and every day we're, we're doing it. You know, I, I, I was driving to Jerusalem today, you know, they lifted the, the lockdown. And here I am sitting in the same traffic jam with, um, with, with, with our neighbors from different villages and different towns. And, you know, we roll down the window and, and joke with, with each other. And I'm, I'm saying to myself, hey, where is, where is the BBC crew here? Where is CNN to come and see, you know, a career settler mm -hmm. and, a, and a neighbor of his from Ramallah sharing jokes at the, at the, uh, at the crossroads uh, and, and at the roadblock? But what I, what I think it's very, very important to, to emphasize, and this I'll, I'll turn it over to my esteemed colleagues. Um, it, it, is, it is very important that we understand, first, that we don't repeat the mistakes of the past. Since the Oslo Accords, 1994, the international community has pumped $20 billion into the Palestinian Authority. Now, I don't, I don't know if anybody really understands what that number is, but in order for you to understand, it's 15 times the amount of money that was spent on the Marshall Plan to rebuild Europe after the Second World War. Now, what do we have to show for it? Well, I'll tell you what we have to show for it. We have to show for all that money is that between 1967 and 1987, at the outbreak of the First Intifada, in other words, 20 years of the occupation, the economy grew in Judea, Samaria, and Gaza at a rate of almost 5%, that's 4.8%. From 1994 to 2014, while all this money is being pumped into the Palestinian Authority, the economy grew, are, are you ready? 0.1%, which means in fact that it contracted that means that the quality of life under the Palestinian Authority contracted. The people's quality of life decreased, regressed. So the first thing we have to understand is, particularly now as Biden came into office and we're looking at a repeat, if not worse than the Obama years, don't repeat the mistakes of the past. You're not going to create economic uh, 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 peace. You're not gonna create economic benefit. You're not going to create a quality of life for the Palestinian Arabs in Judea and Samaria by pumping donor money in. On the contrary, it's going to be stolen. It, the, 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 the corruption is going to become more rampant and nobody is going to benefit on the ground. And once we move that off the table and realize that there are things that can be done, like what Avi Zimmerman is doing in uh, Ariel, like what Yaakov Berg is doing in Psagot by raising the standard of living and creating economic viability with our neighbors, that's going to win the day and not making the same foolish mistakes of the past. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yechiel. Um, Avi, give us, you, you know, give us your perspective. You're doing so many things and I, I would love to hear and you to share with, with the public um, what do you, how do you see this normalization, this economic piece? Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Yechiel. Looking forward to hearing from Yaakov as well. And of course, a pleasure and honor to be here on this call at this event with all these distinguished organizations. So thank you for hosting me. Um, there's a lot to say about uh, normalization and economic peace, but let me just start real quickly with terminology. I'm no, I'm no fan of the term economic peace, although that's frequently associated with the work that we do at the Judea and Samaria Chamber of Commerce and Industry, and certainly at the Integrated Business Roundtable. Uh, I recall our recent events uh, over the last two years, we've hosted the Israeli-Palestinian Economic Forum, 
I know there are a number of people uh, who are tuning in here who are uh, averse to the uh, P word, the Palestinian word, but it is the, the, the term that we use for that event uh, and when speaking with our uh, Arab associates in this region. And so at these events uh, regularly, we're told, uh, you know, people will take the, the stage, all sorts of dignitaries, uh, American dignitaries, Israeli dignitaries, other dignitaries, and they'll speak of the virtues of economic peace. And I quickly uh, take the podium and, and request that we speak not of economic peace only because the word peace has become so toxic for such an extended period of time because ultimately we all think of something else when we use the word peace. Uh, for the most part, the term peace has been associated with the two state solution. And so uh, let's, in my humble opinion, I, I actually like the term normalization, but it has its limitations. Uh, its advantages, and I understand that uh, not today's event will focus on this, but in two weeks, you'll be focusing on the Abraham Accords. And there indeed, this concept of a warm peace or uh, normalization is a term that's used. And really just let's be normal. Uh, let's do business with one another like everybody else on planet Earth is doing uh, regularly on a daily basis. Yechiel just spoke to this now. President Rivlin said, said this earlier. Just do business and everyone's going to benefit from it. Yigal spoke about, again, the virtues of uh, income, GDP. It's so obvious to us. That's how we live our lives. Why can't we do the same thing in Judea and Samaria? I think the limitation of the term normalization is also because it sounds so normal. It's clearly not a given. Uh, this is an uphill battle because there are so many that are opposing the normalization between Israelis and Arabs. But once we can get to that point, it should not plateau. Uh, normalization seems normal. It seems run of the mill. It seems simple. Uh, so A, it's, it is uphill. It's not simple. But even at that point, there are more things that can be done. I personally recommend that we do, don't remain complacent with uh, what's already been accomplished and amazing things have been accomplished. The fact that Israelis are employing Arabs um, right, left, and center uh, on both sides of the green line. We're going to hear from Yaakov Berg in a minute, who himself employs Palestinians. Uh, the, this is uh, something that needs to be applauded and embraced and, and advanced. But we don't have to stop there. Indeed, President Rivlin spoke about the possibilities of innovation, of technology. Uh, I don't want to get too much into what we're doing, and I don't want to monopolize the conversation, but I will mention briefly that on March 8th of this year, we look forward to launching the Field Integrated Innovation Accelerator. It's a business accelerator for integrated businesses of Israelis and Palestinians. And that's just one example. Uh, we have, you can see here by the logos, the Integrated Business Roundtable, which is a group of impact investors, which you mentioned, Sarah, before, who are investing in these partnerships. International investors who see value in investing in these partnerships. And we've already made our first investments and are looking forward to more. And so more can be done. Uh, normalization, yes, I think is a better term than economic peace because it's easier for us to share a terminology, but uh, there's more on the horizon. Thank you. I don't know, you know, I, I don't want to give up the word peace. Uh, we already gave the, the you know, the, the phrase uh, human rights. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure I, I, I'm willing to, to give up on this, uh, this word as well. Um, but you know I what I love- I wouldn't give up on it just real quickly, Sarah. I wouldn't give up on it. I like the word shalom. I'm a much bigger fan of the word shalom. It has a deeper meaning, uh, but uh, let's just be careful that when we're speaking with people, we're using the same terminology. Otherwise it can kind of, kind of boomerang and people will uh, assume things that don't need to be assumed. Okay, toda, toda Avi. Um, you know what I love in this panel that we have three different perspectives. Uh, and I would like to, to hear from Yaakov and please share with us your, your perspective. You're doing, you know, you're, you're doing the actual work. Uh, you, you're, you have uh, your industry, your winery in, in Benjamin, in Judea and Samaria. So, so how do you see these things, these frames, these phrases, sorry? So first of all, I want to say that it's really not fair like to talk after Avi and of course after a real, like I, I don't have any chance. Nah. So, <laughs> okay, so I'll, have I'll, me. I'll, okay, I'll try my best. So I think there, I think there, there are two aspects. First of all, the, the, you know, there is the personal aspect. And when I'm saying personal aspect, I mean that if I walk with somebody, with my neighbor, my Palestinian neighbor, and I'm always, I'm inviting him to my, 
to my, I don't know, kids bar mitzvah or, or, or you know, all my events. And many times they invited me to come to their homes. I think this is the, that's the beginning because I start to know them. They start to know me. You know, my kids know, you know them. And so, so uh, although it's not, the, you know, all the population, it's not everybody, it's not, but it's, it's, it's the beginning. And I think it's the beginning for both sides because, you know, always when you build walls, you start to think that the other guy from behind the wall is something terrible, something scary, something. And so that personal aspect, it's very important. And I see it, you know, day by day, really day by day. If my Palestinian friend or worker or somebody that I work with have a problem and he called me, and, and you know what, I'll give you, I'll give you, I'll give you a story. One day, my, uh, the guy that built me the winery, Abu Ibrahim, uh, he came to me, he says, Yaakov, listen, my kid, uh, I need to marry my kid, and please, I, I need some money. Can you, can, can you borrow me some? He says, no, Abu Ibrahim, no problem. How much do you need? He says, how much do you need? And I gave him. A day after, really a day after, my friend from, for, from the army that I spent many times, you know, met, met some years with him in the army and like, like a Jew, he came to me and he says, call me, he says, Yaakov, and the same, the, 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 the same request, Yaakov, I need whatever, can, 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 can I get some money? I says, Chaim, no problem. Please sign, sign a paper here. Say Yaakov gave you that amount and whatever you have, you, you give me back. And I gave him. So to my Palestinian friend that I, you know, I didn't spend so much to, with him in the army and I gave with not, without a paper. With my friend that I know him, you know, we're, why? Because I know, because I know Abu Ibrahim and I know Abu Ibrahim that if I will ask him to sign a paper, he's not going to talk to me anymore. And I know that Chaim has no problem because he knows that that's, it's okay, it's fair enough. In other words, with that personal connection, you start to know something that it's behind, you know, behind scenes, behind the simple things. And I think that's the most important thing. So this is the first aspect. And, and the second aspect, of course, of course, business, when you do business with somebody, when, when you know, I have a Palestinian employees, when I do, when, when, you know, I sign a contract with Palestinian to build a winery and, you know, and he gets so much money for me. And when you do business with somebody, like everybody say, everybody benefit. They have a motivation, they have motive to, to, to you know, to know me to do something with me. So, so, so I think there is no, cannot be doubt that this is the real, when, when we talk, you know, when we, when you say the word peace, this is peace. Because to say, let's, let's build a wall, let's divide. I don't want to see you. And I mean, the end is going to be that I'm going to hit him. He's going to hit me and that's it. So if we believe, if we talk, if we say peace, if we believe that we have a, supposed to be a future together. It's only by doing business together because I believe that only that way can really bring us one day, it's not going to be tomorrow, but one day to the understanding and especially to the Palestinian understanding that they benefit, they have a lot to lose if we are not going to be here. So Yaakov, let me continue with you, you know, because at the end of the day, we're going through, you know, this tension between Israelis and Palestinians and paradise is, is you know, is far away from here. Um, and what obstacles, what challenges are, are there in the path that uh, to, to this uh, normalization, to this economic peace? Could you share with us uh, from your experience, what challenges, um, what challenges are, are on your way, our way? Uh, yeah. First of all, I'm sorry to say, Sarah, I disagree. I think paradise is almost here. Okay. <laughs> You're welcome to come and take a look. Of course, you have a winery. <laughs> okay. No, 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 not just, no, seriously, seriously. You know, people that come aboard and, you know, they came with the same, they assume that it's going to look terrible. We are, you know, we're suffering. We are, it's terrible. And I don't think that's the reality. I think the reality that we are almost, 
almost in heaven. Uh, and I don't like to complain. We have only few, few little things to, to you know, to accomplish. But however, uh, uh, it, it's a, it, it's a, it's a, it's really, it's a great and difficult question. I, I, I think both sides. And you know what? I don't like to talk about the Palestinian side because I, I, I know I cannot control on the Palestinian side. I, I like to, to talk about our side. I think we also we, the Jewish people, the Jewish government. I really think we can do more. We must to let's call it give a price, give that to and to to give them good reasons to do it. And I think we can do much more. I have, you know, we have a whole plan how to do it. But it must to be clear. And I think President Trump was the first one that put it on table saying, because, you know, because this came from business, he's saying, if you do that, you get. If you don't do it, tomorrow morning, you get less. And I think when, when and like I say, we have, we, I can give you a lot of example what we can, what can be done and a lot can be done on field, not just. Okay. Okay, Avi, I, I'm moving forward to you. I, I really would love, like you're doing so many things and you, you touch so many people and so many, you know, different profession, um, professionals. Um, what obstacles do you, are your, are there, sorry, in, in your way, in this path of, of normalization? Um, yeah, there are quite a bit of, quite a number of obstacles. I'll try to make it simple. Uh, I know we have limited time, so I'll make it brief. Um, I, I do agree, by the way, with Yaakov, that for Israelis living in Yehuda, Shomron, Judea, and Samaria, uh, for the most part, uh, yes, uh, you know, we're, we're almost there. Uh, there there's really uh, the lifestyle, the quality of life, the, the ability to be part of Israel and to be living in this region at the same time. Um, it's uh, nothing short of uh, prophetic. Uh, realization of prophecy. However, uh, our neighbors are not experiencing the same bliss. And uh, those neighbors, uh, some of the challenges that Yaakov just alluded to, a lot of them have to do with policy, but policy on a deeper level, because a uh, policy cannot accommodate a different population when policy is previously, as Yechiel mentioned before, instated the Palestinian Authority. Meaning if the Palestinians can't find what they're looking for with the Palestinian Authority, and they in turn look to Israel or Israelis to provide what they're lacking once, uh, until Israel will assume responsibility for that uh, request of support, uh, we're going to constantly be stuck. And our associates, our Palestinian associates at the Judea and Samaria Chamber of Commerce and Industry are constantly caught in this very, very challenging situation. I'll give you the quick example of my co-founder of the chamber, Ashraf Jabari, of Hebron, who has bravely and boldly stood up for the uh, value proposition of working with all Israelis, including the so-called settler community. And yet uh, he certainly is not going to get the backing of the Palestinian Authority, but he does not, certainly not sufficiently get the backing of the Israeli government either. Now I understand he's not an Israeli taxpayer, but he is literally putting his life on the line to forge these partnerships between Israelis and Palestinians. And he has very little to show for it from uh, an Israeli uh, support system. Uh, it is indeed the uh, civil administration which is responsible for the uh, coordination between the Israeli and, Pal and Palestinian populations. And um, you know it's difficult. Uh, there, there's just politics and, and a system that's not equipped to deal with this. And I would say kind of in the bottom line, uh, when we established the Chamber of Commerce and when we established the Integrated Business Roundtable, we try to take responsibility. We try to look forward and say, what are the next decades going to bring? What is the pathway? What vehicles need to be developed to bring prosperity to this region for all populations? And in order to create that prosperity, we need those vehicles, but those vehicles have to be complemented by government. I'll give one quick example, by the way, which uh, just might be some light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, I've heard some of the, the concerns about the, uh, and maybe it's just because I'm, I'm confused between what's been said and what I'm seeing popping up here in the Q&A and in the chat, but uh, there are concerns about the Biden administration. What's that going to look like? And it's a really you know good question. At the same time, 
Uh, I don't know how many people are aware, but there's a new piece of legislation that passed at the end of 2020 uh, called the Middle East Partnership Fund Act, which provides $50 million per year for partnerships between Israelis and Palestinians, partially through USAID and partially through the Development Finance Corporation. Uh, indeed, our friends at the U.S. Israel Education Association were instrumental in seeing to it that Israelis and Palestinians alike living in this region can be part of that, can benefit from that package. That doesn't mean that, again, we were using the term peace or that it means one thing or another. It does mean that there are governments, sometimes not our own, that are looking to support these business partnerships, and there are new opportunities here. So yes, lots of policy challenges here, but Hopefully, as one government and one policymaker moves forward, the rest of the puzzle will start with a certain degree of dynamism moving forward as well. To that, I, I, I'm moving to you, Yechiel, and this is my last question that I, you know, uh, I'm going to ask, and then we'll take a few questions from the audience. Um, so one of the things you do at the Shiloh Policy Forum is that you're a member of the, the team that builds a plan for the economic development of Judea and Samaria. Um, this plan includes both Palestinians and Israelis, and that, sorry, um, it, it can, you're saying it can be promoted um, even in the absence of a political solution to the conflict. Could you take us to this, like, it's very, it's very interesting, it, it, you know, uh, I'm curious to hear, and I'm sure our audience also curious to hear about it, do it short, <laughs> but uh, you know, give us a glimpse to this this plan. Short is within ninety minutes, one hundred and twenty. <laughs> what, what is short? Yeah. I'll tell you, Sarah. The first, the first big positive takeaway from this panel is that I know if I need a loan from Yaakov, I've got to come with Abraham. Uh, so <laughs> okay, so we did something. <laughs> that's that's certainly a, 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 a coexistence at its best. Uh, no, but seriously. Yes, I'm just going to ask. You think it's it's realistic to you know just to skip the the political solution uh, to the conflict? No, no, no. The only thing that's realistic is skipping the political solution. <laughs> that's okay. the only thing that's realistic. It, this comes back to the little ping pong that you had with Avi previously um, between normalization and peace. It's the difference between formal peace and functional peace. I think what Avi meant by, normaliz by, by not really liking peace so much and preferring normalization is that he meant a functional peace. And, and I think that's what you meant as well. Um, you know, White House lawn ceremonies uh, with everybody stroking everybody else has gotten us nowhere. They're insignificant. You don't make formal peace with a kleptocracy who spent an entire lifetime focusing on terror and justifying terror. That's irrelevant. But you know, the, the people on the ground who want their kids to go to school and go to college and uh, be able to put bread on the table and have a better life, um, you know, those are the people that you make functional peace with. So the only way actually that we can move forward with a practical peace is by going over the heads or under the heads of the political echelons and doing it with uh, the, the masses of people. And, and it's important here to take note of a few numbers. At the present time, you have about 150,000 Palestinian Arab laborers in uh, the Israeli economy, about 110, 115 inside the Green Line and about 30,000 in the Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria. Now that represents 20% of the Palestinian Arab labor force. Okay, now think about this. If we, but by the way, that 20% represents 40% of the income in the Palestinian Authority. That's a huge 20%. But think about these numbers for a minute. If we implement the plan that we're working on, which calls for an extension of existing uh, industrial zones and the building of seven new industrial zones, okay, we could expand, we could provide employment opportunities for another 20% of the Palestinian labor force. For another 150,000, it's about 60,000, 70,000 in existing um, uh, industrial zones with their expansion. 
and 90,000 with new industrial zones. That means another 20%. Now, Sarah, another 20% of the Palestinian labor force is exactly their unemployment rate in Judea and Samaria. So if we uh, uh, provide another 150, another 160,000 jobs, we've eliminated unemployment in Judea and Samaria. Now, in the Gaza Strip, because it was so important for Israel to unilaterally withdraw for the benefit of humanity. So we did so much good for humanity that now, in 20 years, the estimate is that the Gaza Strip will not be fit for human habitation. That's a Palestinian estimate, okay, of critics of the Hamas government, where 53% are unemployed, where youth unemployment is over 60%, and where there is no food security for about 50% of the population. Great job we did by uh, unilaterally withdrawing. So what we have the ability to do, because we are in 60%, 61% of Judea and Samaria and Area C, by providing these industrial zones where we have the authority, instead of putting money into the kleptocracy in areas A and B, where the money is just going to go down the drain into pockets and into Swiss bank accounts, in our industrial zones, we're going to benefit both Israel and the Palestinian Arab population. Because a high-tech society needs a mid-tech and low-tech to back it up. You can't maintain a high-tech society without mid-tech and low-tech alongside of it. The factories in Judea and Samaria that provide the massive amount of jobs will provide uh, uh, that uh, further uh, income, uh, benefit both economies, eradicate unemployment in the Palestinian Authority. And just one last point, and this is a plan that uh, the Shiloh Policy, Policy Forum uh, presented just a few weeks ago in an international conference with the, uh, uh, with the Gulf states. In addition to all of that, what we propose is the creation of a, a free trade zone in the Jordan Valley that would straddle both uh, uh, Israel and Jordan on state lands, which would uh, be built on a total of 42,000 dunam, just for public consumption. A dunam is about a quarter of an acre. So we're talking about a huge amount of area. The potential job placement there is 250,000, which would uh, solve tremendous problems that Jordan is ex experiencing right now with Syrian refugees that have flooded in from the north. They're in desperate need, Palestinian Authority, people are in need of employment, and Israel is in need constantly of economic expansion. This could be a bonanza for the entire region, particularly if we connect the uh, Jordan Valley Free Trade and Industrial Zone with the Gulf states. So we can create a corridor like the old biblical Silk Road that would run from the Gulf states to the ports of Haifa and Ashdod and fundamentally, practically change the entire region and raise humanity, raise the standard of living in the entire area and show the people all around us in civil war in Syria and civil war in Yemen that no, the way of Iranian terror doesn't work. The way of economic prosperity and coexistence does work. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm so happy that I challenged you, uh, you know, uh, to, to make it short because it was so interesting. Um, You've been coming, Sarah. Ken. <laughs> uh, but, but you know what? You know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to mention another thing and ask you, Yaakov, because I think you're inspiring our audience. And, and so, so before I'll take the questions from, from our audience, I want to share with, with our audience uh, the fact that, um, Yaakov, you was one of the great, uh, sorry, um, one of the great challenges faced um, by businesses in Judea and Samaria is the fear of, of the BDF, or the BDS, the, the boycotts, right? Uh, and you are fighting against the labeling of products that are manufactured in Judea and Samaria. I would love, you know, you, your fight was, your struggle was so uh, inspiring and I would love it if you could give us some background and, you know, keep it short because we're really running out of time, um, but explain to us why was it so important to you specifically and what was the result of it? Uh, 
you know, I, I, I born in Russia. You know, no, nobody is uh, perfect. And I came, to Israel, I came to Israel when I was uh, three years old. Voila. And I remember first time when uh, I was driving with my father and, uh, you know, somebody, some of our neighbors, the Palestinian neighbors, Arab neighbors throw stone on, on us. And I remember my father stopped the car and ran after the guy. And of course, we catch him and we take him and bring him to the police. And he says, listen, Yaakov, uh, I came from Russia. I, I have a, and my father had a black belt in karate because his father told him that nobody is going to beat him because he's a Jew. But he, but he get a lot of, okay, it wasn't the, the reality. He says, when we are here in Israel, nobody, nobody is going to full stone on me. And nobody, and I remember, for years, every time, you know, we've been late for work. My father was running after them. There was no one time that we didn't catch the guy and take him and beat him back and bring him to the police. In other words, I don't believe, I don't think that the, the, the idea of saying, you know what, ah, it will over, uh, they will forget. It's just uh, bad days, and the, that, those bad days will, I, I don't think, I think the history taught us that we need to stand up and say no. And I mean, what is my sin? The sin is that we came, I came back to my homeland, and I produce wine here, and, and I share it with my Palestinian neighbors. You know, I, they, they work in the winery, I pay them, like Yechiel said, almost two and a half time what they're getting paid in. I mean, what is my sin? What, what, what's the problem here? I really don't understand the problem. And I think that if our enemies will understand that we are standing on our rights and we believe in it and we are not, I mean, this is the reality. And I think now maybe, maybe, maybe we are not there or, or we, are, we are not there, but I think we are almost there. Then one day uh, the whole world will understand that, you know, we had an administration, the Trump, that, that believe in that, that understand that what we're saying, it's, it's the truth. We just came back to our homeland. And I know, and I, and I see, and I know that there are millions, more than hundreds of millions of people all around the world that believe in that. They believe in the Bible. They, believe, they know that we are, we, I mean, we are not thieves. We are not murderers. We, we didn't come to steal somebody. We came to bring, to give, not to take. And I think that voice needs to be, to, I, I don't know. We, 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 to we be need heard. To say, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. We need to say it somewhere. We don't need to be shy. I mean, we don't need to be afraid. And, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes you lose. Sometimes you win. Listen, we lost. And I think we win. And, um, and I believe that we cannot stay and say, you know, the government, government, Bibi Netanyahu, eh, why you do nothing? Bibi Netanyahu, what's going on? No, it's not just Bibi Netanyahu. We also have responsibility. My responsibility, okay. like, like somebody that tried to do some business in the area, is to stand and say our truth to the world. And I think many people really heard it and, 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 and participate. Toda, toda, really, mamash toda. Um, I want to take two questions from the audience. Um, I'm gonna ask and beg our panelists, uh, just keep it short, because um, we're running out of time. Uh, we have a question from uh, Mr. Kevin Williams. Uh, Dr. Leiter's point about the tremendous economic growth amongst the Arab, sorry, the Arabs of Palestine in 1967 to 1987 is key. PA leadership, the Palestinian Authority leadership uh, cheerfully threw it all away and seemed to have popular Arab support. Why, why, I think it's a great question. Why would economic growth and cooperation work, sorry, cooperation work this time? So what, what's the difference from, from the past? Yechiel, you wanna try and, and uh, challenge and a answer this? Well, uh, history is not stagnant, um, you know, uh, few things have happened since uh, 1987. Um, 
you know, we, we've tried. We've recognized the PLO. We brought their leadership here from Tunis and from Lebanon. And they turned it into a, 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 a terror-based uh, kleptocracy. The people here also have gone through many difficulties. Um, you, you know, uh, it, during the first Intifada, uh, there were many Palestinian Arabs killed by their neighbors. Uh, the second Intifada, where we had to respond finally for the, the wanton murder of Jews, took a toll on the Palestinian Arabs. I mean, it, you know, they, they, they've had enough of this. And it's very interesting, but several times where the Palestinian Authority, for example, when Trump said he, President Trump was going to recognize uh, Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, um, the very same calls that uh, the, the Palestinian Authority issued when uh, uh, former Prime Minister Sharon made his dramatic walk on the Temple Mount, which apparently was the, uh, uh, the reason for the Second Intifada, which of course it wasn't, but um, uh, nobody answered the calls. The same calls were made um, at, the, at, the, at the time when President Trump said he was going to recognize the Golan Heights as Israeli sovereignty on the Golan Heights. And nobody left their homes. You had a few scattered teenagers that were throwing stones in, in, in uh, some remote places, but there was no public uprising. And there's no public uprising because time has passed. And uh, they realize that their neighboring countries, I mean, look, the, 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 the GDP per capita in Judea and Samaria is uh, larger than uh, it is in Egypt, all right? They look over the border and they see what's happening in Syria. They see what's happening in Lebanon. They see what's happening in Iraq. And you know, this occupation isn't all that bad. And it, at the most important point is that it's no longer an occupation. And that's the biggest change that's taken place in response to Mr. Williams. There is no occupation. Areas A and B are under the Palestinian Authority. There is a government there. Now, whether or not it's all the trappings of, uh, of sovereignty that the West would like to attribute to it is irrelevant. The fact of the matter is that we have no civil government today in Nablus or in Ramallah or in Hebron or in Bethlehem, Kalkilia, and, uh, uh, and so on. So that's the big change. And they've been under a government of the Palestinian Authority since 1994. They see what it has wrought. They are not terribly happy with it. And I think that um, we can uh, create a de facto situation which will allow for uh, 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 the civil coexistence between uh, Israelis and Palestinian Arabs. Um, Sarah, if I can just add real briefly, 30 I seconds. I have a question for you, Avi. I have a uh, question for you. So, so, hold on. I, I just okay. I want to ask the question. And when you answer, I, I want to aim it to you because it's a last question. And when, when you answer shortly, you can you, you can give a, a sentence about this um, previous question. So Jack McKay is asking um, the, the following question. The PA provide, uh, sorry, forbids businesses between Arabs and Jews. How does this affect um, affect making economic peace, and how is this ever going to uh, to be overcome? I think that you can answer this question, you know, the best. Um, thank you, Sarah, and um, it actually dovetails very uh, very nicely with how I wanted to add to what Yechiel was mentioning. Uh, the system is broken. Let's recognize that the system is broken, and when we look, I'm hearing a consensus here kind of let's shift away from the politicians, let's shift away from the governments, and let's do things, as Yaakov was saying before, let's do things on the ground, let's create this reality. Um, in some ways, that needs to be the mantra. Uh, we have to do things that are going to effectuate change, and yet we always realize that you get to a glass ceiling at a certain point. And at a certain point, you can't do, th there's things you can't build without governments. Uh, Yechiel's uh, very ambitious and exciting plan for the free trade zone is going to need government participation. Um, that government may not be the Palestinian Authority though. And indeed the Abraham Accords have already pointed us in the right direction. There are people, there are Arab states who want to play ball, they want to work together. And so on a domestic level, specifically here in Judea and Samaria, the answer is day in and day out, do business together, make deals. Uh, just. The, the simple language of a chamber of commerce or anyone who wants to do business with their neighbor, keep doing business. And uh, it's true, the Palestinian Authority does not allow that. And yet 
the benefits of doing business with Israelis outweigh the risks and the risks are significant, but they outweigh the risks. Of course, the Palestinian uh, people require or need a better leadership for themselves. I'm not here to knock the Palestinian Authority per se, but I am sharing the thoughts of what my Palestinian associates do say. And so the system is broken. Let's do things on the ground on a, on a business to business level that works. People find workarounds. Um, and let's encourage when you start nearing those glass ceilings, government and again policy as mentioned earlier to correspond and follow it. I will say that last point, um, we like to think or we tend to think that government holds all of the cards, all of the playing cards, and it's just not true. There are, you know, traditionally we think of these three sectors, the government sector, the business sector and the social sector. And uh, the business sector is a player. Let's empower that business sector and believe it or not, government will respond. Uh, we're gonna finish this, uh, this session and I wanna thank you personally. Uh, thank you, Echiel. Toda raba, toda raba, Avi. Toda raba, Yaakov. It was so interesting, and I think you, we, you know, we could continue with it. In, I, I see, you know, the, the questions are jumping, and every question is is better from from her, uh, from the other. And really, thank you. It was fascinating. Uh, we're gonna continue with these last with these uh, last words. We end this fascinating and exciting event today. Uh, I would like to thank the President of the State of Israel, Ruby Rivlin, the Ambassador Gilad Erdan, Mr. Mort Klein, and Mr. Eagle Dimoni for their words. Uh, and I would like to, you know, I want to thank you for being with us today at the Judea and Samaria virtual media event. Next week, February 14th, we will meet here at the same time at 11 a.m. Eastern Time and talk about our legal rights. This is so, you know, this is so relevant today after this weekend's uh, horrible news about the, the, the U from the, the, the ICC news. Um, uh, so we're gonna talk about it. We talk, we're gonna talk and open uh, about the, the legal rights to Judea and Samaria uh, and the ramifications of Pompeo's recognition to those rights. I invite everyone here to be a part of this event in the next uh, two weeks. Registration on the link you can find here on the chat on, on Facebook, uh, on the Facebook pages of each uh, of, of uh, organization or uh, partner in this event. And please remember, please, please remember the power to fight lies is in our hands. As Yaakov says, as Avi says, as Yechiel says, you know, this is in our hands. We hope the knowledge that you gain today and will gain in the next few days will allow you to be even more effective in this fight. So, Shalom, Velitrot.